This is The Critical Thinker, Episode 7. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Episode 7 of The Critical Thinker, the podcast dedicated to helping you master the art and science of reasoning well. I'm your host, Kevin DeLaplante. I'm an associate professor and currently chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Iowa State University. And when I'm not terribly busy with that job, I produce content for the website criticalthinkingtutorials.com. Before we start, let me first give a thanks to Corey Engel, a podcast listener who suggested I break the audio and video versions of the podcast into two separate shows so that people can subscribe to them independently. He gave me some excellent advice, and I just want to say thanks and announce that I have split the shows. So if you do a search for The Critical Thinker in the iTunes store, you'll find two versions of the show, one audio and one video, and you can subscribe to one or the other. Okay, the title of this episode is The Five Essential Components of Critical Thinking. I was encouraged by a friend of mine to write catch your headlines for my podcast episodes, so I hope this satisfies him. This episode is actually kind of important because it's going to function as a sort of roadmap for organizing future podcast episodes. Just about everything I have to say about critical thinking falls into one or another of these five component areas. So in this episode, I want to make a first initial pass over the five areas, and then I want to begin a second pass that unpacks things a bit further in each of the areas. This second pass is going to take up a few episodes, so I hope you'll bear with me. Okay, here's the first pass. The first component that we need to understand to be effective critical thinkers is, not surprisingly, logic. The second component is argumentation. Sometimes the term logic is used broadly to include what I'm calling argumentation, but it's more helpful to distinguish the two. Logic and argumentation are not the same thing. We'll talk more about this distinction in this episode. Now, the third component that we as critical thinkers need to understand is rhetoric. This might surprise some of my fellow philosophers who associate rhetoric with the art of persuasion without any special regard for good reasoning or the truth, but trust me, it belongs here. The fourth essential component of critical thinking is background knowledge. One of the dirty secrets of critical thinking instruction is that all the logic and argumentation skills in the world will not make up for ignorance. If you don't know what you're talking about, your arguments are going to suck, no matter how good your skills at logical analysis. And finally, the fifth essential component of critical thinking is the cultivation of a certain set of attitudes and values. Attitudes towards yourself and to other people, attitudes towards uncertainty and doubt, attitudes toward the value of truth and knowledge, and so on. Critical thinking textbooks don't talk about this very much but it's an absolutely essential component of critical thinking. Okay, that's a first pass through the five areas or components of critical thinking. My claim is that you can't really be an effective critical thinker unless you commit to working on all five areas because they're mutually dependent on one another to work properly. It's gonna take me several episodes to really make this case, but I'm gonna put it out there anyway so it can jostle around in the back of your mind. Okay, let's start back at the top and dig a little deeper into the first two areas. We talked about logic and argumentation, but what exactly is logic and how does it differ from argumentation? Well, one way to think of this is to treat argumentation as the broader category and logic as an important component of argumentation. The central organizing question for argumentation is, what does it mean to have good reasons to believe something? It's in the theory of argumentation that we try to answer this question. It's here where we define what an argument is and isn't, and try to come up with standards or norms for distinguishing good arguments from bad arguments. Now, when we frame it in this way, the theory of argumentation is actually a branch of philosophy. It's a subfield of the broader discipline that philosophers call epistemology, which is the philosophical study of knowledge. And it intersects with another subfield of epistemology, which is the theory of rationality, of what it means to think and act rationally. Now, as you might expect, there's more than one way to tackle these questions. And what you'll find if you survey the literature are theories of argumentation and theories of rationality, not just one. However, there is general agreement on some aspects of argumentation. For example, there's general agreement that if an argument is to provide good reasons for an audience to accept its conclusion, then it has to satisfy at least the following two conditions. Number one, the premises must all be plausible to the intended audience. 
And number two, the conclusion must follow from the premises. The first condition has to do with whether the audience thinks the premises are true or not. The second condition has to do with the logical relationships between the premises and the conclusion. Now this second condition is what logic is all about. It's the discipline that deals with the question of what follows from what. Let me give you an example. If I believe that all swans are white, and my buddy Jack tells me he owns a swan, that I'm logically committed to the belief that Jack's swan is also white. If I were to deny this, then I'd be contradicting myself, since if Jack swan isn't white, then it can't be true that all swans are white. This is an example of logical inconsistency. A set of claims is logically inconsistent if they can't all be true at the same time. Now the concepts that we just used here, the concept of logical entailment and of consistency and contradiction, these concepts are defined within the field of logic. Now, an important feature of logical relationships is that they don't depend on the specific meanings of the terms involved. I can rephrase the example we just gave without referring to swans at all. If I believe that all X are Y, and my buddy Jack tells me he owns an X, then I'm logically committed to the belief that Jack's X is also Y. And this will be true no matter what we substitute for X and Y. Logical relations hold even when the claims involved are false. If I believed that all rabbits speak Italian, and if Jack said he owned a rabbit, then I'd be committed to the belief that Jack's rabbit spoke Italian. And if I denied it, I'd still be contradicting myself. Now, these examples show that logical properties are really formal properties. And when we're doing logical analysis of an argument, all we're doing is investigating the formal or structural properties of the relationship between the premises and the conclusion. We're not interested in the content of what's being asserted or whether the claims involved are even true or not. Still, logical analysis can be a surprisingly powerful and versatile tool in argumentation. It's effective because it trades on our natural desire to avoid contradictions in our reasoning, and is at the root of some standard argumentative techniques like proof by contradiction or reductio ad absurdum, which is Latin for to reduce to the absurd. I'll give you an example. My friend Stephen tells me that gay couples shouldn't have a legal right to marry. Why? Because in his view, this legal right is grounded on what he calls the proper function of the institution of marriage. Which is what? Which is to provide the healthiest and most nurturing environment for the raising of children. And more specifically, the biological offspring of the parents, since the biological family unit is the core of our social system. So, because same-sex couples can't have biological offspring, their union can't fulfill the proper function of marriage and therefore they shouldn't have a legal right to marry. Now, looking at this argument from a purely logical standpoint, we can say two things. First, if we clarify the premises enough, the conclusion does follow from those premises. If we grant all of Stephen's assumptions, and there are many, it does follow that gay couples should not have the legal right to marry. This is a logical property of the argument. And notice that this property has nothing to do with whether the assumptions are true or even plausible. When we're doing logical analysis, we're only interested in what follows if we grant the assumptions. Now note also that in saying that the conclusion follows from the premises, we're not saying that the conclusion is true or that the argument is a good one overall. It has good logic, but we haven't said anything about the plausibility of the premises themselves yet. Now, the second observation we can make about the logic of this argument is that the scope of this argument is actually very broad. It's much broader than Stephen seems to realize. Why? Because from the very same assumptions, it follows not only that gay couples shouldn't have the right to marry, but also that a good number of heterosexual couples shouldn't have the right to marry either. Most obviously, couples who are sterile or who are too old to have children. Why? Because without the possibility of having biological children, their unions can't fulfill the quote-unquote proper function of marriage either. Now, in pointing this out, we're not challenging any of Stephen's assumptions. We're just drawing out the logical consequences of those assumptions. Left as it is, Stephen's argument entails certain conclusions that aren't very attractive. Stephen is unlikely to accept the conclusion that we should deny sterile couples the legal right to marry. But if he's going to reject this conclusion, then he's forced, as a matter of brute logic, to reconsider his assumptions. Otherwise, he's guilty of inconsistency. Not all of his beliefs can be true at the same time. And here's another important point. Logic can tell us whether a set of beliefs is consistent or inconsistent. 
but by itself it can't tell us which belief to modify in order to remove the inconsistency. That's a choice that Stephen has to make, and he can have reasons for preferring one way or over another, but which choice he makes won't be dictated by logic alone. Now, when we move to the level of argument analysis, we're not just analyzing the logic of the argument, we're also assessing the truth or falsity of the premises themselves. We're asking, are these assumptions plausible? Are they contentious? Do they need supporting evidence or argumentation to back them up? We're also asking whether the argument ignores certain facts or evidence that would count against it. So it's at the level of argument analysis that we would ask questions like, are we willing to grant that the legal right to marry should be grounded in a couple's capacity to have biological children? If this doesn't strike us as obviously true, what arguments could be given for it? How are legal rights normally grounded in our legal system? Should we distinguish in this case between legal rights and moral rights? And so on. It's also at this level that we might want to consider the most popular counter-arguments in support of same-sex marriage and see how the issues raised in those arguments might bear on the reasoning that Stephen is using here. So to sum up, one way in which argument analysis differs from purely logical analysis is that argument analysis is also concerned with assessing the truth or falsity of the premises. In purely logical analysis, we bracket this issue and just ask ourselves whether, if all the premises were true, would the conclusion follow? All right, that's all the time we have for this episode today. Not surprisingly, we're really only scratching the surface of what logic and argumentation theory are about. Both of these are fields that are much richer than you might think at the outset. FYI, on my website, criticalthinkingtutorials.com, the first two tutorial courses are devoted to basic argumentation theory and introductory logic, respectively. So if you're interested in a more systematic exploration of some of these concepts, you're invited to check them out. Next episode, I'm gonna stay on this logic topic, but I'm gonna broaden the scope and talk about logical systems and the roles that different logical systems play in our understanding of how human beings ought to reason. I'm also gonna talk about where the normative force of logic comes from and ask whether there's such a thing as a logic for reasoning about chance and uncertainty. So until next time, have a great day.